Hello, it's Joe Simhart here. I'm in my studio in Pennsylvania, second installment of my discussions about cults in the occulture. If you listen to my first talk, I mentioned this painting I have back here of a raven with dice coming down from the clouds. Um, it's actually a representation of the uncertainty principle. We live in an uncertain world and God does play dice with the universe to some extent. We live in a world of probabilities and we have to manage this uncertain world. So we create plausibility constructs, symbolic worlds that may or may not be completely true, may be illusory, but nevertheless they're valuable. Uh, they become religions, they become cults, uh, they can become sciences which change over time. Uh, they become medicinal interventions, which again change over time because sometimes they're bad and not so good, and then they get better as experiments go on and applications get better. So getting that out of the way, uh, today I'm going to get into how I personally went down into the rabbit hole, thus the painting above my shoulder here, um, of theosophy and how I got there. Now, I mentioned my memoir, and again, I'm going to plug it, this book of uh, Santa Fe, Bill Tate and Me. And I'm sitting next to Bill Tate in front of a studio here in the 1970s. I met him in 1975, and we struck up a friendship which lasted until his death in 1987. But in his gallery, he had a variety of books, mostly on art, but he also had some on history and some on esoteric topics. And I picked up one that I borrowed that first day and I began to read um, by Manly P. Hall. This one here, and this was the book. Uh, it's published in a later edition in 1971. But Hall called this book The Secret Teachings of All Ages, but the original title was Masonic and Hermetic, Kabbalistic and Rosicrucian Symbolic Philosophy. That's a mouthful. And indeed, um, Manley P. Hall, who died l later in the uh, 20th century, was a talented writer, a theosophist. He ran something called the Philosophical Research Society, but he was very much into the occult. And, you know, as, it, as the book mentions, he's um, promoting Freemasonry in its, in its uh, esoteric sense. And he explores a lot of things, but he sort of dedicates this book to uh, a character that I'm going to talk about. His name is Saint Germain. Uh, Manly P. Hall tried to convince us in his book that Saint Germain was Prince Rockatsy, which was one of his aliases. Now, no one really knows, uh, with all the research that's been done on this character, who he was, essentially. He may have been the son of a merchant uh, named San Geronimo uh, from Italy. Um, but we do know that he was skilled at, at um, creating dyes, um, at, at fixing jewelry, um, kind of an alchemist. Uh, he could write some music, uh, but he was a great storyteller and even a braggart by many standards, uh, quite a narcissist by some, including Voltaire. Um, so I got curious about this book and, and Saint Germain and theosophy and, and a lot of things which it led to. Um, one of the things that Hall tries to convince people of, and he does a good job of it, is that Saint Germain was the personage Sir Francis Bacon later, and, um, and that Bacon was responsible for writing the Shakespeare plays, that Shakespeare was just an actor and he was really too stupid and inexperienced to write such plays. Well, you know, most people, uh, scholars that, that look into this story today will uh, say there's no evidence to show that, that um, anyone but St. Germain wrote the, uh, I mean, that, that Shakespeare wrote the uh, Shakespeare plays. But here in, in Hall's book, he superimposes a picture of Bacon over a picture of Shakespeare. So, and so the mythology goes that Saint Germain was this person and that 
he used to tell stories that he was a thousand years old. Uh, there were stories about him that he, he never died or that he ascended in uh, the 19th century to become a member of the Great White Brotherhood or the White Brotherhood. Um, there were other people that believed in the legend of Saint Germain, even though he died in kind of obscurity, uh, was taken in by Prince uh, Hesse Castle, who was a Freemason, and um, he wanted to believe Saint Germain, but um, who, who died in his house in his 80s. Uh, but the legend went on, and um, the writer of The Last Days of Pompeii, Sir Edward Bulwer-Lytton, also wrote a lot of occult novels. One of them was Zanoni, one of his most famous. And he based the character Zanoni on the stories of Saint Germain. Um, this book was subsequently read by Madame Helena von Hahn, who became Blavatsky later when she was a young woman, and she believed the, the myth behind the myth of Saint Germain and Zanoni and carried it on in her own teachings in theosophy, and uh, she became a channel or an amanuensis for Saint Germain and other masters in her um, esoteric section of the Theosophical Society. And, and, and other groups took up the Saint Germain myth um, including the I Am activity. This is one of their early books in small form. And we see that there are two prime masters here, Saint Germain pictured here and Jesus pictured here, that were channeled by the I Am leaders, Edna and um, Guy Ballard, also known as Godfrey Ray King and Lotus Ray King. So in other words, they took on a another name similar to what Saint Germain did, uh, another handle, so to speak, in, in terms of their spirituality. Um, they wrote a book called Unveiled Mysteries, which was the uh, story of Guy Ballard, allegedly, meeting Saint Germain and being taken into the hidden realms of Mount Shasta, into these sacred temples and, and other places on these mystical journeys, uh, kind of like a Carlos Castaneda uh, in the 30s, uh, going with his Don Juan, in this case it was Saint Germain and Guy Ballard or, or Godfrey Ray King. Well, as it turns out, Unveiled Mysteries was a highly plagiarized text uh, from a number of volumes. Uh, Mrs. Ballard wrote the book. It wasn't Guy Ballard, even though it was about his life. And um, one of the books that they plagiarized from was called The Brother of the Third Degree by uh, Will Garver. And this came out in a late... 19th century, in fact, in 1894, I believe. But Will Garber is describing Saint Germain in this book, and there's a passage in here which is quite fanciful, uh, Saint Germain and war. And the protagonists in the story enter into this mystical place, and they meet these uh, people in kind of a temple area with a big table in the center room. And they describe the people around it, including Madame Blavatsky, who had passed away by then, and someone named Count Nikolsky and others. But then they see uh, this man at the head of the table. Uh, when we got out of the carriage, he was tall and spar sparely built with long golden hair, a light curly chestnut beard. This man, whom I knew from his position at the table, was the superior of all and had no certain age. His pale, serious face was not marked by a single wrinkle. Yet, I knew he was not young. His eyes were blue and shone with a fiery luster, and I noticed that his hands throbbed as they rested upon the table. That this personage may be no mystery, I will say he was the celebrated Count de Saint Germain who was supposed to have died a hundred years before, but who never did. Okay, so this is from the late 19th century, and, and so this legend of Saint Germain has, has proliferated. Um, when I was researching this after I left the cults I was in that believed in Saint Germain, without hardly trying, I found 14 different people that were channeling Saint Germain for their particular cult followings. Most of them quite small, and some, like Elizabeth Prophet, had, you know, by some counts, 10 to 20,000 members. So, you know, the legend goes on, and uh, we even have Umberto Eco, who wrote The Name of the Rose, here in his. Uh, fanciful novel called Foucault's Pendulum, his primary character in here is Saint Germain, or a, var a, a variation of him, but it's, it's, it's a good one. And uh, Echo knew the whole story 
of the occulture surrounding Saint Germain and, and that whole territory. And, and so reading this, I've read it a couple times, it's a fanciful jaunt into that occult world. And if you want to get a taste of what that occulture is, read Foucault's Pendulum. And it's fiction, but I mean, a lot of it reads kind of true in terms of how people react to this sort of stuff and begin believing in it. Um, just to give you another instance of, of how people thought of him, of Saint Germain, Will and Ariel Durant in their Story of Civilization, uh, the ninth book, The Age of Voltaire, they wrote that, according to Montesquieu, 18th century Paris swarmed with magicians and other impostors who offered to ensure worldly success or eternal youth. The Comte de Saint Germain persuaded Louis XV that the sick finances of France could be restored by secret methods of manufacturing diamonds and gold. Um, Saint Germain got to Louis XV through Madame Pompadour. Uh, he was just one of those people that entertained the courts and some people believed him. Other people like Voltaire thought he was a charlatan and a braggart and quite the narcissist. Um, and we also have, you know, in, in more modern times, this character here who calls himself Peter Mount Shasta. This book came out in 2010. It's an autobiography. Uh, it's called Adventures of a Western Mystic an apprentice to the masters. Uh, his main references in the back are the I Am books um, by Godfrey Ray King, uh, one, of the, one of the books that I was the one that I picked up. He also, you know, brother of the third degree, which I also showed you here as a reference. Uh, Zanoni, he uses as a reference. Um, you know, and, and other stories about Saint Germain. Um, anyway, he believes himself to be a, sort of a modern master, and he's still living out there in Mount Shasta. He has himself pictured in here holding a, a sword of truth and uh, with Mount Shasta behind him, his head here. Um, again, if you want to believe this, fine, but um, he's a character that totally believes in this kind of thing. Again, one of the many, many thousands of characters and, and millions of believers in the awe culture. Um, in fact, uh, Christopher Partridge, who I borrowed the term from, the awe culture, has written extensively about this. He's a scholar in England. Um, he calls it ordinary, that, that, you know, what we consider hidden mysteries and mysterious is actually ordinary in culture. Most people are quite superstitious to some degree. They believe they have a little bit of psychic awareness or, or, or power, and uh, they don't write it all off. And maybe it's true, they say. Um, you know, so hardened skeptics are hard to find, um, or at least, let me put it this way, people with skeptical skill. Uh, I mean, I rarely ever meet anybody that, that doesn't say I'm skeptical. You know, I was skeptical before I, I stepped into this uh, uh, group and I knew what I was getting into and I believe it's true. Uh, well, being skeptical and knowing how to apply skepticism are not the same thing. Applying skepticism, skepticism is not instinctual. It doesn't come from some resonance in your brain. It's, it's, it's a practiced art and a science. It takes time to learn, and, and it's, it's not easy. Um, just to finish up on St. Germain a little bit here, The Myth of the Magus by E.M. Butler is a good source. She covers the story quite well, and, and you get a very good idea of you know, why St. Germain was essentially a charlatan and quite manipulative. And the other one came out in um, the 1800s and one of the first to, to completely deface uh, who St. Germain was. And, uh, but one of his chapters in Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by Charles McKay um, covers the story of St. Germain quite well too. And it's a fascinating reading in that older language. Um, but but yeah, there's a lot of information out there about this character, but I think he represents in some way the, the, the essence of what we're talking about when we're talking about the art culture and its, its extension in, into high society as well as uh, uh, the general population. So anyway, uh, I'm going to leave it at that for now. Uh, I wanted to give you some idea of uh, my own journey, my own rabbit hole journey following St. Germain into various cults and then coming out the other end face-to-face -face with the charlatan and putting him on the bookshelf with a, a lot of other things that I probably should have better not experienced, but I did. 
And uh, anyway, thank you for listening, and I hope you learned a little bit of something about St. Germain.